Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lewis Fawcett, and I serve as the president of the National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives. Um, some of you on this Zoom, I know, and it's good to see your smiling faces and be back with you. Others, uh, this may be your first interaction with us. Please know that our mission at NANO is to serve you. And so the resources that we offer, the ideas, uh, the websites, the books, the webinars, everything is with one goal in mind, and that is to change and save more lives. Uh, you are our heroes. You are on the front lines, and we are on the front lines with you. And we know that a lot of the things that you've been told about the nonprofit sector over the last four or five decades are simply wrong. Um, you've been handed principles and ideas and uh, told that this is the way it is in the nonprofit sector and that this is the way it works. And that might have been true in 1960, but it's certainly not true in 2024. And so everything we do at NANO is to serve you so that you can accomplish your missions to change and save more lives. Everything that we do is from the viewpoint that we apply the same principles that we know work in the business sector to the nonprofit sector. You may have been told that's different for nonprofits. It's no different. You have to run a nonprofit like a business if you're going to change and save more lives. So uh, with that being said, I want to welcome my colleague, Lauren Wilkie. Uh, she is a guru when it comes to grants. She's our grants guru. Um, she is an expert on organizational development. Um, she is... I know this is cliche, Lauren, but I really do see you as the Energizer Bunny. I mean, it, you know, she, she just always has a smile on her face. She's always working, 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 going, going, going. It, you know, I had one supervisor tell me I was the, the Tigger in the Winnie the Pooh Bunch. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, so Lauren's energy is contagious. Lauren serves as the CEO of Safe Light in Henderson, North Carolina. So, uh, Lauren, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the group? Uh, so, I'm Lauren. I have been working in nonprofits in North and South Carolina for 22 years. Um, I am both a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed advanced social worker, which you should know are the best kind of social workers. Um, so what does that really mean if you if you have all those letters and what it is what is it for social work? Um, that means I can both practice therapy, but also I'm uh, advanced trained for running nonprofits. So specifically organizational development and evaluation. And I love getting to work with teams. Um, my favorite thing to do in nonprofits is get in there and fix and really find how to put people in the right roles and really see how we can create more programs to fill the gaps and build a continuum to save more lives. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, it's great to have you here today and I'm looking forward to hearing you present because you always uh, make me laugh and you always put a new spin on things. I'm always learning from you. Uh, so, with that being said, let me let all of you know what our roadmap is for today. Uh, five, the five secrets for attracting foundation grants. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to do that. Um, we're first of all going to put the uh, uh, the idea of attracting foundation grants within the context of the major gifts ramp up model. Then Lauren is going to dig in, uh, do a deep dive into those five secrets 
and then we're going to take your questions and your comments. Now, of course, today is about you. So anytime you have a question, just unmute yourself and interrupt us. Or there's, there's some way on Zoom to put your hand up. Uh, it's like this virtual yellow hand that comes up. And that will highlight you and we'll be able to stop um, and take your question. Now, um, it's hard for us to monitor the chat. So if you put something in chat, we'll try to get to it. But it's better if you just unmute and interrupt us or if you put your hand up. That helps us uh, get to your question faster. But we'll try today to answer everyone's questions and take everyone's comments. Um, and feel free to tell us we're crazy. Um, we're fine with that, too. We kind of enjoy it. And um, we'd love to have that discussion. My wife tells me I'm crazy quite often. Uh, so that's where we're headed. That's our roadmap for today. And I'll just start with the biggest takeaway for today that you can have. And that is, regardless of whether you are approaching a foundation, a government entity, a corporation, a family, a church, or an individual. Your goal is to find the decision maker and to develop a conversation, a relationship with that decision maker so that you are maximizing the time that you're spending and the return on your investment in that time. It doesn't make any sense to go online and fill out all of these forms and submit all of this paperwork and do that over and over and over again and just get no after no after no. I mean, it's nice to say that you applied for 100 grants, but if you don't get any of them, then what's the point? Um, and why would you spend time filling out forms and doing paperwork for $1,000? Doesn't make any sense. So today, our approach is to help you get the most amount of money in the least amount of time, to monetize every hour that you're spending and to maximize the return on your investment. Now, as I said earlier, we want to put this first, the idea of going to foundations within the context of the major gifts ramp up model, because this is the way we approach everything. And then I'm going to turn it over to Lauren to dig in to some specifics about approaching foundations. So the major gifts ramp up model has been used for 34 years in all 50 states in more than a thousand organizations to raise way over a billion dollars. It is a model that works in every organization and in every town, regardless of the size, in every culture and in every community, because this model is based on normative human relationships. Now, we often talk about this model in terms of raising money from individuals and families, because more than 80% of philanthropy in this country comes from, 80, from individuals and families, but that also includes family foundations. Today, we're going to talk about the model in terms of specifically foundations. So we construct the major gifts ramp up model in three six month phases, the planning phase, the building phase, and the inviting phase. And we begin in chapter one, management philosophy. Most nonprofits spend 95 to 99% of their time on program service delivery. And then they treat foundations and grant making organizations as ATM machines. Oh, we're going to fill out this grant. We're going to get the money. 
um, oh, well, they give us money every year. So all we got to do is just fill this out and meet the deadline and they're going to give us money. Well, there are two problems with that. The first problem is they don't have to give you the money. The second problem is if you don't develop a relationship with that foundation, with that grant making organization, then you're not providing yourself the best opportunity to upsell them, i.e. increase your funding, nor are you providing yourself the best opportunity to extend that funding year over year over year, nor are you providing yourself the best opportunity through that foundation to secure additional connections to organizations, foundations who can help fund your mission. So when we talk about management philosophy, we're inviting you to repurpose your time to treat your donors as your customers. So in the same way that a business focuses its efforts on serving its customers because customers pay the bills, we're asking you to repurpose some of your time to focus on the people that pay the bills. Now, I know that the need you're serving is great. And I know that you're working 50, 60 hours a week because there's always another family, another person, another issue in your communities nationally or in your states or national or internationally that needs to be served. I know it's always growing, growing, growing. In order to serve that need, you're going to have to prioritize your funders so that you can grow your revenue so that you can grow your funding. So management philosophy begins with that gut check first. Are you willing to repurpose some of your time? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? That's the other piece of this, right? Because many of us in the nonprofit sector on the program side have become comfortable with our routines and comfortable with uh, how we go about serving. And sometimes we become so comfortable in that that we just see fundraising and relationships with foundations as that thing over there that we really don't want to have to do. And if we can just get by another year, we'll keep going. So management philosophy is about willing to be uncomfortable to venture into a new area. And it's about repurposing your time. Now, we know that you don't, you certainly don't have time to focus on thousands of relationships or even hundreds of relationships. So with major a focus on major gift fundraising, we want you to narrow this down to your top 100 opportunities. Your top 100 foundations, um, really your top 100 major gifts, whether that's a foundation, a corporation, an individual, a church, you've got to start with that top 100. And we see that top 100 as being at at least $5,000 or higher. Over time, we want you to, to that floor to be raised, right? So that a major donor to your organization is not $5,000, it becomes $10,000. Then it becomes $25,000. Over time, you build that top 100 so that the number 100 on your list is giving at least five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Now, organizational development is about understanding who you are, what you're doing, and where you want to go. It is about having a game plan for success that includes a three-year budget. It includes staffing your organization properly to serve the need of your mission. It includes compensating your employees properly so that they stay with you. It includes benefits for your employees. And it eliminates things that have been inefficient in your organization. So when we talk about going through organizational development, it ties in directly with receiving foundation grants 
Because if you're not able to effectively describe who you are, what you do, and where you're headed in a concise manner that's clear to the person on the other side that's reading the grant or the person on the other side to whom you're speaking, then you're not going to get anywhere. I know you are all good people working hard to serve a need. Unfortunately, when it comes to foundation funding, you don't get any points for that because there are 1.5 million organizations in this country that are all great people working hard to serve a need. So you've got to make yourself stand out. And part of the way you make yourself stand out is by having a game plan for success. It's not strategic planning. It's not having a retreat with the board on a in a cabin uh, on a hill over a weekend with sticky notes and flip charts and highlighters and Sharpies. It's not having your board member come up with some crazy idea about how you're going to save the world. And you're like, oh, there's no way we're going to do that. But you can't say anything because they're a board member. It's not about putting everything in a nice notebook with spreadsheets, flow charts, org charts. It's not strategic planning. This is a real-time battle plan where you assess where you are, where you want to be in three to five years, and how to get there. Understanding that then helps you represent that in a case for support. And that case for support is typically an eight or 12-page document that is like an investment prospectus for your organization. When you develop this case for support and you're able to send that to a foundation as part of your collateral documents, as part of your appendices and your application, it shows them that you have your ducks in a row, that you know what you're doing, that you have, you have a history that ties in with your community, that you've had impact, that you have programs that work, and then it shows that you have a game plan for the future. It also helps you get clear on how you are asking. In other words, how do you describe your ask to a foundation? Um, how do you do that in a way that doesn't use buzzwords? I mean, anybody can say, well, we partner with a community organization to or community organizations to collaborate to empower families to make lasting change that creates a future that doesn't mean anything it's just a string of buzzwords but when you're able to in your case for support say we run an after school program that costs $250,000 a year that serves 300 kids that helps them stay in school and graduate. Now we've said something and, and we're creating a clear picture for a funder about who we are, and what we're doing. So getting this case for support together is about you being clear and then creating a clear message for your funders. We're also gonna make sure that in, in getting clear in our messaging, we're testing that case for support. So that's why this is the only chapter in the major gifts ramp up model that's split in two, because we have to make sure that we are testing this with our inner circle, that we are uh, hitting all the right notes. We're providing opportunities to refine this case for support to make it better and better and better. All right, now, once you've developed that case for support, it actually, in parallel with that, you're creating an advancement calendar. And an advancement calendar is your game plan for the next 12 to 18 months. We prefer 18 months. We encourage you to purchase six 90-day dry erase calendars and put them on the wall and date those out for 18 months. And then put everything up on those calendars that you know you're going to have to do. Board meetings continuing education, uh, committee meetings. Um, go ahead and put the dates of those grant deadlines for these foundations, for your funding partners up on that board, any events that you have, and then overlay that with the tasks of major gifts ramp up. And then you get to make some decisions about what's really important because you can't do everything. We're not asking you to work more. In fact, we're asking you to work less. 
we're asking you to to look at the next 18 months and figure out how you can build efficiencies into your organizations. You don't have to have a staff meeting every week. I promise you, you don't. You don't have to have a board meeting every month. You don't have to do the same old tired event every single year that doesn't make you any money simply because Sweet Mildred has been doing the event for 25 years. We love Sweet Mildred, but if the event doesn't make us any money, then why are we killing ourselves to do this just because we don't want to hurt Mildred's feelings? When you sit down in a room, just you and your top leaders, not the board, not your entire staff, I'm talking about two or three people, and you take a look at the next 12 to 18 months, you get to have some honest conversations with yourselves and with each other about what's really important, about what's really helping this organization, about what's going to help you bring in more revenue and what we need to eliminate because it's been a waste of time for a long time. Once you do that, now you've got 18 months worth of revenue generating tasks up on those calendars, you bring that down and you put it in a simple Word document and you list all of those tasks with soft deadlines and hard deadlines month by month by month. February, 12 or 15 things that you need to accomplish in February. March, 12 or 15 things that you need to accomplish in March. April, May, June, July, all the way out for 18 months. It's in a Word document. It's in a list. You can share it with staff. You can share it with your board. Then you go to work week by week, day by day on accomplishing the tasks that you have set forward for yourself that are going to enable your organization to grow its revenue and its impact. Now, prospect identification is where you're looking at creating a list of those top funders. Who are those top foundations that are funding you now? And who are those foundations that have funded other organizations in your community, but haven't funded you yet? Now, you can go on ProPublica or GuideStar and download any 990 you want for any foundation. And you can put in search terms like children uh, or veterans. You could put in your state. Um, so there are all kinds of ways to, without spending a lot of money, to research what foundation opportunities are out there and put them in your prospect list. You can also go to the different websites of other organizations that have a similar mission or a similar geography to you. Oftentimes, they will put in their annual report. And in their annual report, they will often list their major funders. That's a great place to figure out what foundations, what corporations, what families are funding other organizations and to put them on your prospect list. Now, in addition to that, we use a product called DonorScope where we download the names and addresses of millionaires within a particular radius of your location, and we invite them to a non-fundraising awareness event. Now, we're not talking today too much about individuals, but I just want to let you know that we do have a way of inviting all of those millionaire individuals in your community to a non-fundraising awareness event. And here's what's important about those millionaire individuals. They are attached to foundations. Either they have their own foundation or they're on the board of a foundation, or they know people who are connected to foundations. And so you may look at a, this list and say, well, who are these people? I don't know who they are, Lewis. I'm going to look at, back at you and say, these are people who have liquid assets and net worth right there in your community of $5 million and higher. And I promise you that they're either connected with the foundation or have their own foundation. And we're going to invite all of these people, all, the, all of these millionaires and community influencers, 
all of the foundation officers, you know, the if you go on any foundation website, they're going to have a staff of program officers. And, and larger foundations, for instance, are going to list which officers relate to different impact areas. So if your impact area is education, a large foundation will have a program officer dedicated to educational funding. You absolutely want to invite her to this non-fundraising awareness event. So you're going to create a prospect list of all of your existing funders and potential funders and invite them to this luncheon. And you're very clear on the invitation that it's a non-fundraising awareness event. You're going to have a special speaker or an awards format. It's going to be from 1130 to 1 with a tight timed agenda. And you're going to roll out that case for support to everyone in attendance. And you might be thinking, well, Lewis, what does this have to do with foundation grants? I'm letting you know when that program officer from that foundation or that board member from that foundation or that executive director or CEO from that foundation attends this luncheon, you're cultivating them for your next grant because they're coming to this and they're saying, wow, this organization really has its stuff together. They put together a great event. They've got a great case for support. They've got great people speaking in their community. Um, Lauren, every year you host a non-fundraising awareness event called the Henderson County Humanitarian Awards. Um, I'll take a little break from, from talking. I'd love for you to chat about how um, hosting the Humanitarian Awards has helped you build grant funding for Safe Light. Absolutely. So this April will be our fourth annual Henderson County Humanitarian Award. I love alliteration. I actually named my son Wyatt Wilkie. So uh, when I found out um, Henderson County Humanitarian Awards wasn't taken, I was like, great, I'm going to take it. And I just checked with a few big names around town to make sure I wasn't going to step on any toes of some of the big groups that fund us that do award events, which was our local chamber and our local community foundation. So I just checked in, told them what we were planning to do and they all gave us the blessing to go ahead. And so every year we do five awards. I can um, actually pull up and show you um, what those awards are called. Cause I have it pulled up because we're working on that event plan now. So here's our event plan for April. And we've got our agenda kind of lined out in planning. And in red means this is what we're working on. And so as I go into my board meeting next Tuesday, our board members now have the list of our nominees for this year. And we'll be voting on those, having any discussion, considering some people for next year that we had as runners up. And then those names will go um, I'll contact them to make sure they accept their award. And then I go into February with going ahead and printing these awards because the event's in April. And that's why a really good timeline is just so important and so crucial. When you've got an event, you start six months out with some of that planning and thinking. But well, we Lauren, sure I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want you to blow that up a little bit. I apologize for interrupting you, oh. but I want everybody on the call to see some of the names on this award list because this is the key. You get to give an award to the foundation from whom you want funding. And when you honor them, they are then more likely to either continue their funding or give you more funding in the future. So look at what, who Absolutely. Lauren is. This one on here is a target specifically for that. So I'm gonna talk about just Hunter Hometown Foundation. They've given us grants for the last three years in a row. And one, I want them to be nominated because this last year they were so excited about our animal kennel project that we built. They gave us a great renewal and didn't make me write it, which is unheard of. I love them. <laughs> they also come and bring gifts for the kids every holiday. Their whole team goes shopping and buys uh, thousands of dollars of gifts and brings it to our shelter. Um, but besides their volunteerism and their grants, I'm targeting them specifically. They've not done a big sponsorship and they do sponsors as part of a separate part within their company so i not only want to recognize them for their good works but by giving them award they might also come in as the signature sponsor for that event which could give more dollars for the agency perfect so 
having thanks lauren having a non-fundraising awareness event is a cultivation opportunity for all of your different funding buckets including government officials government officials love to come and help you celebrate the impact that they've had and they love to be recognized, right? And if you have a government official that's been in, 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 um, instrumental in get, helping you get funding, you want to celebrate them during one of your events. So that non-fundraising awareness event is one of the keys that then leads you into Chapter 8, Prospect Cultivation. And this is where you get to sit down with potential funders. This is where you have an opportunity face-to-face -face with that program officer I just described, or that executive director or CEO of that foundation to have a meeting and say, hey, I'd love to hear more about what you want to accomplish this year with your foundation. Now that's very important. You're going to them and saying, I want to hear more about what you want to accomplish with your foundation this year. You're not going to them and say, I want to tell you about how wonderful we are, about all the wonderful things we're doing, and about how you can fund us so I can ask you for money. No, you're going and asking questions, getting to know them as people, first of all, first and foremost, because people give to people, right? I mean, that's the overarching theme of this entire webinar today. People give to people. And so when you go and you sit down with that executive director, CEO, program officer, board member of a foundation, and you ask her, well, where did you grow up? Um, where'd you go to school? What do you do for fun? Tell me about your family. You're getting to know her, and I promise you, she is going to reveal things that you never knew would could find anywhere else or never would know, and you're going to be able to connect that eventually back to your mission and the people that you're serving. So first and foremost, this is an opportunity to sit down over coffee, breakfast, lunch, cocktails with someone connected to a foundation and get to know them as people ask them open-ended questions. Again, not saying anything about your organization. Then get to know about their goals for their foundation for the coming year. Well, tell me more about the, the people you want to serve. What are your focus areas? You know, what have you done in the past? And are, are you making any changes moving forward? Um, do, you, do you only fund capital efforts or do you also fund programs? You know, do you ever fund endowments? There are all kinds of open-ended questions, and they will give you all the information. And you haven't had to say one thing about your organization. If you spend time with someone, whether it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, asking them questions about themselves, eventually they're going to come back around and say, well, tell me about you. Tell me about your organization. And now they're ready to listen and the goal of this Chapter 8 Prospect Cultivation is for you to learn about them, um, to figure out what their funding uh, lens is. In other words, what are their focus areas for funding? Also learn how much funding they offer. Um, now, you can do a lot of this research on the 990 because any foundation is going to list who they've funded in a previous year. Again, ProPublica is my favorite. You just scroll down that 990, it's going to list the organization and the amount funded. So you're going to get a sense from that. But when you go and sit down with the program officer, the board member, the staff member, you're going to get a much better sense of where they're headed. And ultimately then, you're, you're working toward them inviting you to submit which is much better than you submitting cold on some online portal and, you know, hoping to get funded. I mean, that that's the same as buying a lottery ticket. I mean, I, I look, you know, when the Powerball hits about 600 million, I always say to my wife, I think I'm going to stop and get a couple of lottery tickets. 
And and we joke, right? Because why am I waiting for it to get to 600 million? Because it would suck if I won 50 million. I mean, what's the, you know, it, it's, it's not like that'd be bad either, right? But for whatever reason, you know, I, I like to, to when it gets high, really crazy, you know, amount, I buy a couple lottery tickets and I always am so hopeful, you know, and I'll even say to the attendant, you know, if I win, I'm coming back to, to, to give you part of this. But look, there's no way I'm winning the lottery. And for a lot of these cold, for almost all of the cold applications you fill out online, you're not getting it. You're just wasting your time. This is why you want to meet one-on-one -on -one with people. Then, now we're at the one-year mark in this effort. The non-fundraising awareness event was at the six-month mark. Now, at the one-year mark, you're going to host an evening ask event, which, again, is a cultivation opportunity for staff members, board members, uh, program officers who were attached to a foundation. Because you are in this fundraising event you're gathering together 200, 250, 300 community leaders who are going to be celebrating your organization. Once again, you're presenting case for support. You're making an ask, and you're going to raise anywhere from four to six hundred thousand dollars in this evening. I'm I'm not saying that a foundation person is going to make a foundation commitment that night. I am saying that this is another cultivation opportunity where they get to be in the room with other millionaires and community influencers who are generously supporting your organization. They then are going to think more deeply about the support that they're offering your organization. Lauren, why don't you speak about Night of Hope and how you've been able to cultivate people through that event? Oh, goodness, it's... Uh, this past year's Night of Hope raised uh, $650,000, which is incredible because it was our third annual Night of Hope. I'm going to say the first one raised around $150,000. The second one, we were getting close to $300,000. And then this year, we raised six hundred and fifty. So next year, I'm thinking a million. Can we do? Can we break a million at that event? Um, but it's numbers that for such a small county as Henderson County in West North Carolina, our agency felt like it was unheard of, that we would never would be somewhere that could, as Lewis talks these big numbers, I'm like, yeah, right. And I had someone in the room that night write a $250,000 pledge and give a $10,000 check with it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> and it's that cultivation. Um, it takes over time a myriad of things that your team is doing to get people in your, in your community talking about why your agency is doing such great work and so worthy. It takes meeting with them several times and building that relationship. And then the Night of Hope is just the cherry on top of the Sunday you already built. It's just the ta-da moment where you get to dress up, have the moment, see it live in play, and all that money's coming in. But I had a donor ask me, to, uh, another fundraiser asked me the year prior, y'all didn't really raise $250,000 that night. I said, no, we didn't. We raised it over a year, and that night is when it was gifted and pledged. That's perfect. Okay, hang with me. We're almost done with the model, and then Lauren is going to dig into the nitty-gritty of uh, securing grants. Uh, I'll just let you know the other reason that I have Lauren on this call is because I stay as far away from grants as I can, right? Like, I mean, they scare me. Like sitting down and asking somebody for $500,000, a million dollars, no problem. That's easy. But writing a grant, oh my gosh, just I'd rather have a root canal. So Lauren, in a weird way, she enjoys it. And that's why I call her the grant guru. All right. So we're now at the one year market, uh, one year mark in this effort. You're now going to create a campaign cabinet made up of 15, one five, 15 millionaires and community influencers who are each going to take responsibility for six relationships. Some of those six relationships, I promise you, will end up being foundations. You may not know that on the front end. But when you sit down with your campaign cabinet and you present them with a list of prospects that includes some foundations that have funded other organizations but haven't funded you yet, 
I promise you someone in that room of 15 people is going to know someone who is either in staff leadership or in board leadership at that foundation. And they now then can help you open that door. That's why this is not your board. This campaign cabinet is not your board. These are people who are agreeing to help you each with six relationships. When you get 15 people each helping with it, at least six relationships, that gets you into 90 to 100 campaign interviews. Remember earlier, I said we're just talking about your top 100. Those 15 members of the campaign cabinet are going to help you narrow and get to that top 100. And once again, just like chapter eight, this is your opportunity to sit down with that foundation officer, that staff member, that board member of that foundation and listen, seek their advice, ask questions, and then ask permission for them to consider funding your campaign. And you can do that in the context of a three-part ask. You know, some foundations only fund programs. Then your ask is only going to be about your programs. Some foundations only fund capital. So your ask is going to be only about capital. Some foundations may only be interested in endowments. So your ask is just going to be about the endowment. But a lot of foundations, particularly family foundations, have a wide range of flexibility. And so you want to go to them with a three-part ask. Number one, a multi-year commitment to programs and operations. Number two, a larger gift for a capital project. Number three, a gift to your endowment to fund the long-term viability of your organization. You will be surprised. You will be surprised when you sit down face to face with a foundation person and even though their website says they don't fund capital projects and even though they told you they don't fund capital projects and even though the grant application says they don't fund capital projects you will be surprised when they they look at your case for support and they look at you and they look at your case for support and they look at you and they say well you know we never fund capital projects, but what you're doing with this community center for after school kids is so important that I think we would make an exception for this, and you should include that in your ask, and you would never know that unless you get the inside scoop and you sit down with them because the bottom line is they can say whatever they want to say on their website. They can say whatever they want to say on their grant application. They can say whatever they want to say when they're telling you no. But they have flexibility and discretion to fund projects in whatever way they want to fund them. If you carry out those 90 to 100 three-part asks, which include these foundation grants, you're going to get 50 to 60 yeses, and those 50 to 60 yeses lead you to campaign success. So I appreciate your patience as I put all of this within the context of the major gifts ramp up model. I now want to turn it over. Well, Lauren, let me take a break and not, 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 not take a break, but let me ask. Before I turn it over to Lauren to get into the nitty gritty of grant funding, or do any of you have any questions in general about the major guest ramp up model and about our approach to running your nonprofit like a business? I saw one in the chat for you, Lewis. Can you repeat the three components of the ask? Yes. And in fact, I um, can put that, put those in the chat. So, number one, well, you have the three-part ask, and this is always in the context of a written proposal. Even for an individual or a family that doesn't have a foundation, you still want to create a written proposal. Um, so the three-part ask is, number one, a multi-year commitment to programs or operations. Number two, a 
one time large gift to a capital project. Now, a capital project doesn't have to be a building. A capital project could be about a fleet of vans because you're serving veterans who don't have transportation and you got to get them to your program site. So uh, a capital project could be about building your reserve fund. So when COVID happens again, you don't risk going under. I mean, there's never been a better time to ask for reserve funding, reserve uh, money for a reserve fund and for endowment than right now, because with the pandemic, we saw organizations struggle severely or close because they weren't able to serve their mission. And now people are more, much more open to funding reserve fund and endowment because um, because of the pandemic, but you're able to go to them, even if they say, well, we're not going to have another pandemic, which we don't know that, but you're able to say to them confidently, um, a, and the third part is a gift to your endowment, you, you're able to say to them confidently, something bad happens every eight to 10 years. I mean, whether it's 9-11 or the Great Recession or the housing bubble or the dot-com bubble or a pandemic, Something bad is going to happen that affects the national economy or the global economy at least every eight to 10 years. And nonprofits, just like any business, have to have cash reserves and uh, money in the bank so that they can weather those storms. Lewis, I have a question. Yes, James. Uh, our particular organization. Our typical contributions are $25,000 and up. Congratulations. Um, well, but there's not enough of them. <laughs> okay. Your model here, which seems to make a lot of sense and is aimed at somebody's local community, uh, how do you build personal relationships with the Bradley Foundation, for example, or... Uh, well, I could tell you lots of them, but I mean, or William or the Smith Foundation down in Boca Raton, Florida, or this sort of thing. Can I ask you a uh, question? Jay? I under I understand the the whole world run, runs on personal relationships, but it's difficult to get to know board members, for example. And I happen to live in South Carolina, but it, <clears throat> the people that work with us live all over the country. But truth of the matter is, we don't necessarily have an easy way or any way necessarily to meet somebody on the board of somebody that's in Kansas, okay? Uh, so your whole model here that revolves around personal relationships uh, becomes very difficult. I mean, I've I've had other people tell me you, you're wasting your time unless you know somebody on the board there. You'll never get past first base. I think there's some truth to that because when we have been able to build relationships with somebody on the board, uh, life became much better. But anyway, that's kind of the question. How do you What's your advice on that? Or have you written a book about how to do this on a different scale in your local community? Uh, I, I do have some thoughts, James. Lauren, uh, I'll let you go first. So I have several foundations I work with here that the family doesn't live here, but they fund here because they had a connection here, used to be part of it. And so one of my best connections lives in Buffalo, New York never met her. I've invited her to come down several times, but we just talk and I give her updates on the project and what's happening, what we have going on. She gets our e-newsletters. We joke about the weather here being cold and then she tells me how much worse it is there. So we have a great relationship, um, but we've never met. No, well, I got that, but how does that help me establish a relationship with, I'm just out of the blue saying the Bradley Foundation. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, James, and I see Rachel and Chris Bergen. When you come back, I'm going to want you to comment on this. Um, 
So, and I see Rachel is saying the same thing. Um, you're an international organization that does not have location-based programming. And James, it sounds like you are, uh, t tell us about your organization. Uh, what we do is we provide free legal aid to employees opposed to unions, pretty much coast to coast. Okay. We hun we've done hundreds and hundreds of cases. Uh, okay. We so, keep a low, low profile. Some people know of us, some people don't, but. So anyway. in, your case, in your case, dealing with a national issue, um, you're right. There are going to be potential funders in other communities, and you may not be able to travel to meet them. It may not make sense. We got to get invited first. Right. But, you know, picking up the phone and making that call often open door opens doors. Um, offering to get their advice rather than asking for money also opens doors. So here's the rule of thumb. If you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. So we found it effective, even with people we don't know and, and foundations with whom we don't have a relationship, to call someone and say, would you be willing to spend a few minutes? I'd love to get your advice on some issues we're facing. And that opens the door for that conversation. Um, certainly, we prefer for you to visit face to face with someone, but Zoom, just like today, um, is and can be an effective tool in in opening that door for a deeper relationship. And then down the road, it could be, for instance, there's a funder in Boca Raton that you mentioned. You may have a, a supporter or uh, someone connected with your organization that happens to be in Southeast Florida who would be willing to take some time and meet with that person if you're not able to do that. Um, Rachel, you mentioned that you're an international organization that does not have location-based prog uh, based programming. Chris Bergen is on this call. And uh, Chris started 13 years ago from his garage with Allies in Youth Development funding orphans overseas. They're now serving 61 countries. Chris, can you talk about your growth using the Major Gifts Ramp Up model? Oh, yeah. The, it's It's been amazing. But I, I do want to say that I'll never forget a meeting I had in Phoenix with, uh, and I'm in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, a friend introduced me to a company in Phoenix that did direct mail and that kind of thing. And, and I, I asked the guy, I said, well, tell me about grants and how, how can I get more um, involvement in grants? Because I had sent out a bazillion letters and I got back a bazillion and one rejections. <laughs> and he, when I asked him, he chuckled. Ha, ha, ha. You'll get more grants by going to the men's breakfast or going to the Rotary Club or by, you need, it's relationships. You got to make relationships with people some way somehow and then then these things will follow and uh and sure enough the grants <clears throat> that we have uh now one they're they're these these uh grant uh, providers they're mainly in the united states they're not international we're international so that was the first hurdle to get over. And uh, one of the major ones is here in Fort Worth, the Amy Carter Foundation. They don't do, they don't do international, <laughs> but they do allies. <laughs> and that's because of one of the ladies that we have working for, she already had a relationship with them and got us in the door. And um, the other one, uh, it's a Root Family Foundation. And uh, another person that helped us with uh, internet, um, website, that kind of thing. He said, I want to introduce you. He went to a men's breakfast, a men's retreat, a weekend retreat, and met this guy. He said, I want you to, I want to introduce you to Chip. And, uh, and I met him, and he's kind of the same thing. Well, we're really, we've already done our stuff this year. Uh, we really don't do international. I'm telling you, that, that evening... He calls me back and he says, Chris, I have read over your case for support. 
we want to help allies. Thanks, so, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just saying this this process, this you're you're getting a process, you're not getting a nugget with the major guest ramp up. You're getting a a whole turnkey process to help you strengthen and 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 to build your organization. And you you really need to pay attention if you've never seen it before. And you you, you can't get it with just a cursory visit. You need to you need to pause and think about this process that major gets ramp up is. And I'm excited about more grants. I, I know Lewis, you're not a big grant guy, but Lauren, I think I need to call you. <laughs> okay. I don't you say it, Chris, but Rotary International. I'm a local it. international chair for a rotary. So perfect, lots perfect. of support there. Lewis, you've got a lot of questions in the chat. I'm gonna um a summer we're going to touch on later, but here was one. Do you um, recommend, who do you recommend for campaign leadership if board members aren't included? Yeah. And so uh, just type that answer in the chat. The campaign cabinet is at the one year mark in this process, and it's made up of people you've met during that year. So you may not have any uh, ca cabinet members in mind in the beginning, but that's why we build in this whole process that's a year long before you seat your campaign cabinet. Now, usually uh, a couple of board members end up getting excited during that year and want to serve on this cabinet. But this cabinet specifically is a task force that is created to help you get to campaign goal. Um, Rachel, there's another question uh, uh, about major guest ramp up. Um, uh, Lauren put in nano.org. You can also go to nonprofit conferences.org. Uh, and um, those are uh, two day conferences, both virtual and in person, that we offer that, uh, that go through this model in depth over two days. And Rachel, if you, uh, if you send me uh, a direct message, then I'll provide you a scholarship code to that two-day conference. Uh, all right. Um, Lauren, I don't want to get too far afield from the focus of today. Um, so I know there are a lot of questions, and we will try to get to all of those questions later. But we don't, also don't want to be this, uh, this to be our first conversation with many of you. So we may not get your question and everything to you today, but we will get it to you over a period of time. So I want to turn it over to Lauren now to dig into the grant piece, because that's our focus for today. Okay. So I have found doing this a couple of times now with Lewis, especially having over 100 people on the Zoom with us today. We have some people in here that are going to be grant experts, but we also have some people in here who have what Lewis called the terror of grant writing. And I hope, Lewis, if I can use you now that you've done this with me a couple of times, has that lesson just by knowing the process. Yes, <laughs> it has. And Lauren, I've also developed a, a, a deeper appreciation for your commitment to uh, details, uh, and I and I think that that is a, a large piece of what uh, securing grant funding year over year is about. Absolutely, it is absolutely in the details. It is absolutely being very. You cannot be a good grant writer if you are not a good writer. Let's start there. There's a prerequisite that you have to be a good writer. I'm not teaching that today. You cannot be a good grant writer if you're not organized. So if your skill is not organization, you're hiring someone instead that is a good writer who is well organized. And we'll dive more into that later as well. But those are the prerequisites for a good grant writing team. 
So I love sharing this, and I know um, Lewis shared a, a little bit about me, but my team calls me Midas Touch, Magical Unicorn, Grant Queen. I think I heard Grant Guru, and then I also get the Bulldog. And the Bulldog is because I am extremely persistent. I will not let it go. And I'm going to give an example of that one. We have a contract here that's through um, VIA, which is, um, if you will, the local group that oversees all of the uh, insurance for Medicaid and reimbursements for agencies that are contracted. And we have been built into that budget through uh, the federal government for them to subcontract and give us money to provide services. And last year, they didn't send me the MOU to renew the contract. So I emailed, called, emailed, called, emailed, called consistently every week for about eight weeks and finally got the right person because I made sure to send it to different people. And then I got my contract. And so I probably spent about an hour on those email calls, follow throughs, but that hour was worth $20,000. So don't let it go is what I'm saying. Be the bulldog. It's okay. That's the role. Uh, and people are going to tell you no, and that's okay too. You come out the next year and ask again, right? Or you put them on the do not ask list because it doesn't fit. We'll talk about that more. So when we talk about grant writing, well, I have a huge passion for the work I do. And I could assume that most of the people here in this room, when you're talking about the work you do, you get excited. You get a little bit energetic because you're passionate about the work you're doing to save lives, to save the community, to save the environment, to save pets. Whatever you're doing, you have a passion for that. That will show in your donor asks. It will show in your writing. And those people who get the most passionate when they're talking about it tend to be the ones who get more dollars. It does matter. And so if it's not your passion, do you hear I've been there? I was with a nonprofit for five years and I had a, a mentor say, Lauren, is this your passion population? And I went, oh. And then I went and found it and worked with it. And my biggest passion, and I said at the beginning, what drives me is when I can help those find more ways to have efficiency and effectiveness to do more work to save more, to save more lives, to save more pets, to save more of the community, to do it together. That synergy of building community, that's what I get most excited about. Specifically, I love doing that with women and children work for those who've experienced extreme trauma. But bigger picture was, I just love fixing and helping groups be able to do more. I get really excited. I'm like, wow, if we just added this one bathroom, we could serve 16 more people a night. And that means there's 16 less people on the streets freezing or hungry and, and needing resources. So when we talk about grants today, oops, excuse me, I did not mean to scroll my do you know what you're talking about and what you're asking for? That's where we're going to talk more about Lewis's case for support that he's mentioned. And I saw someone say, uh, and he put in the chat a link for some examples. The case for support is first. You got to know what you want, what you need, how much it's going to cost before you go start asking. Have you practiced pitching? Have you done your ask and have you gotten feedback on that case for support, maybe from some of your big donors before you go use it and put it out there? Did it say what you meant it to say? Are you able to articulate clearly what you're trying to ask for? Because if you can't verbalize it, you can't write it. And it's the same thing once you put it into paper for a grant ask. Do you have the capacity the support and a clear project that you can do. What I'm saying here is, you are you just a talker or can you actually do it? Because if you put projects out there that you say you're going to do and you're going to do it in this timeline and you don't, those funders are not coming back to you for a while, if ever. And you've hurt the agency more than help it. So if you're going to dream big, you have to make sure your dream has a timeline that's realistic. Oh, I missed one. I don't know why I'm going to stop hitting my mouse. I've got something up down here that makes me where I can't see it. There we go. What is a good percent 
of writing and getting grants? I love adding this, asking this question because, you know, it, there's not an exact answer to this formula. And I'll just use, you know, if you write 50 of those 50, what's a good number to get? Well, zero wouldn't be so good. That's a lot of waste of time. Well, there's not a perfect answer because what if one of those meets your full budget of the need and you don't need to write anymore? But what if you get five no's and you're disheartened before you get that number six yes? There's not a perfect answer, but I could tell you if you're batting higher than 40%, you're doing great. You are doing great. No's are part of the process, both with individual asks and with grant writing. Lewis, how many, uh, what's a good percent of asking versus getting for donor asks? Uh, it, it, when you get into the meeting where they have, you've asked permission to ask. So we would say, uh, I would say, Lauren, may I have your permission to come and, and chat with you about your commitment to this campaign? And, and Lauren says, yes, come and meet with me. You're at 90 to 95% at that point. Um, but you've done the work and the cultivation to get to that point. So that's one metric. But another metric is for every 10 phone calls you make, you're, it, it's going to get you into two or three conversations, and that's going to lead to one or two gifts for your organization. Exactly. So it's not a perfect match, but it, it should help you to hear that if you're not getting more than half, that's pretty normal to get a lot more no's than yeses. So as we talk today about how you get major gifts, when you're doing your major gift planning and you're doing your strategic action planning, which includes your development plan, and you're thinking through all of those pieces, it should include your big grant ask as part of that plan. When you're looking at your workflow and you're looking at who is gonna be your, your builders, your partners, it should include some of those big groups for your foundations in that plan, for your calls, for your coordination. And there are a lot of ethical considerations that we're gonna talk about today that should be part of your process. I drew this this morning because I love a visual and I love a cheat sheet. I have a cheat sheet for everything. I have a cheat sheet for my cheat sheet. And this is in my mind when I think about my organizational thought process. This is kind of what it looks like. When you're looking at your strategic action plan, it's what are the big goals for your timeline? Is it, you know, a three year or five year? It's what you do. I do it with my directors. And then I take that to my board. My board doesn't develop the strategic action plan. My directors who know how to do nonprofit work develop that. And then they get to bless it and, and ask questions and fill any gaps that we need to think about. But we don't do a two-day board treat with strategic plan because I don't need a banker telling me how to run a nonprofit. But I do need my associate director, my program director who are both licensed clinical social workers to be part of that plan, who know their staff and know their capacity to say, we need this. We want to see this happen. Can you make it happen? And what do we need to do it? Then as you've got those big ideas, you're, how are you going to do it and break that out as your case for support? And if you will, you see kind of the marketing at the bottom, but that case for support is the top marketing piece of explaining what you need to do and how you're going to do it with that budget. And then I break it out. You've got your big advancement calendar, which is your donor engagement and your event plans. But I also have my grant advancement calendar or my grant cheat sheet with goals and timelines, which I follow the same thing that Lewis is teaching for those um, foundations for those appropriation asks, which include my um, city council, my county council, my um, local reps for the state or, or for the um, for representing us in the state house, my engagement there is part of that process. And it uses the same tools, the case for support and that advancement calendar timeline is part of that. And then we have a marketing plan that kind of highlights and keeps the community excited about what we're doing. 
And that marketing plan includes making sure our donors and our grantors know that we've met their goals and here's some imagery and here's what we're excited about and we're still doing these things. You're invited to come participate here. It's keeping them engaged in what's happening throughout the year versus thank you for the check, see you next year. So grants should be part of your strategic action plan. It's part of thinking about the case for support and how you're gonna fund those, those gaps, those program needs in your community. It's part of thinking about your key partners and supporters. And I put this here too, identify your competition. Are you gonna hurt or help what's needed in your community by adding this program or this, or this agency or this piece? Who's already doing it and doing it well? And is it needed? Because when I think about funding, I always think about it as a pie. The money doesn't get bigger just because you came in with a new program into your community. You're just going to take a piece of that funding pie. Are you going to take it away from a project that's doing great work? Or are you taking away from a project that wasn't doing your work and you need to be there because you're showing that that project wasn't needed or it wasn't being covered at all? So you have to do significant research and analysis in your community on the program you're doing and ethically make sure you're creating something that's necessary and needed. And then you got to identify who is signing off with a letter of support with that. What I love about the case for support is you create a host committee in that first year. And that host committee is your partners who are saying this is needed in our community and we support this idea. They're sort of the starters of saying we bless this project. We think this is necessary. But you also may need other supporters in your community show it's necessary and they need you. Maybe it's your local hospitals. Maybe it's the public health department. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe it's other animal shelters. It depends on what you're doing. But who in the community you serve, whether that be local, small community, statewide, or international, who are the people that you need to be talking to now as you're writing your case for support to have them say, yes, this is something we need. Because you don't want them to come out later as a competition or mad or making a stink in your work. You want them to be supportive of it, right? So really then, at the beginning, this is before you're getting into the play, you're not talking to donors yet. You're developing the budget. And as part of that, your timeline, your goals, your outcomes. How many people are you going to serve? And by when? How much is that going to cost? Do you need one and a half FTEs or full-time employees to get it done? What does it really look like? How much do you really need to get it done? And maybe put in a little extra in there for, you know, some things you didn't expect that would happen. So maybe you're adding a small five to 10% extra on top of what you think this is the baseline cost. And then this is, you know, our set goal of what we need to raise. And then maybe a little bit more just because there's something you don't know yet, right? But what do we really need to make it happen? Who in your team is going to do it? Who's going to be responsible for making sure they did it? Because if you've got grants, grants come with reports. Who loves the report side of grants? Anybody? Anybody? Because if you do, I'm hiring you. Anybody? Okay. <clears throat> the report side can be sometimes much worse than the writing side. I see a few laughs there. Thanks, Chris. I feel you. Um, because once you get the money, ethically, you have to show you did it. Or you might have to give that money back. And that hurts. I've never had to give money back. Never going to. But you have to be able to show you did it. You have to have come up with legit goals and outcomes to define, we're going to serve 20 people to show 50% got permanent housing by January 1, 2025. And then you're going to come and do that report in March 2025, and you're going to say, you know what, we set that goal, but we, we have 75%, not 50% and be excited to break that goal. So you want to set a realistic goal that you think you could do better. You hear what I'm saying there? Because you want your funders to be excited with you. And then how are you going to sustain it? 
A lot of grants will ask you this question. Once we're gone, or if we didn't fund you, could you do it? Or how would you do it if we didn't give you any money? And they want to know. They want to know, oh, well, we could pull from our general fund, our reserve fund, but that would pull from an emergency that we might have down the road, but we could do it if you didn't, you know, pull in as part of this project. But if you do, then we're going to have that down the, the road if we need to replace the roof on our shelter, which we expect to be happening in the next few years. And we want to make sure we have that pot of money aside for those floods that are increasing with climate change. It is the same process as with donors, as with your grantors. There's still people. It's still cultivation. It's still follow-up. It's still coming back and saying, I sent a grantor an email this morning because it's 10 degrees here, which is actually unusual for this area. And they replaced our five air units in our shelter this year. It was a $50,000 grant for new air units. And I just said, uh, we've got four of the five done. The last one comes next week. And I said, I can't thank you enough for keeping our survivors and our kids warm. We're so grateful for the new air units. I can't wait to send you pictures when they're all done. We have one more getting craned in next week. And that was it. Just a touch point to let her know how much it means in real time that they were able to help keep us warm. It was two sentences. It took me two minutes to write it. You think I'll get funded again? So to reach outcomes, the order is crucial to success. You don't chase your money, you chase your dream. What I'm saying here is you gotta write your case for support first. Then you're going in to make the asks. Not only will that case for support make you a better, more confident speaker and make your ass look really good, but it's also going to make sure that you're reaching the goals that your whole team strategically said that you were going to work on and that you needed. And it takes time to build that. It's not something you build in a day. It takes a couple of months to do it well. I probably go through every year, you know, we've We've done four now, but every year it takes us a few months to revamp it and to go through several edits back and forth before print. This is last year sitting right here. I keep my last year copies to give out still anyway, because it's still a great document. But then you've got a great piece that makes you look professional when you're going to talk to people and you really have a plan and you have a timeline and you have a budget of how you're going to build the dream. And you're getting to say to your donor, don't you want to be a part of this? And it's a great attachment to your grant asks. Now, we'll tell you, sometimes the grant ask, or oh, most of the time they're in these platforms, they might not fit. So I like to, when I, I always have an email contact for my grant, I send it as a PDF attachment separately, as a thank you for allowing us to write for this. We hope our goals will align with your group's decision. Because usually you have someone you're working with in a foundation, and at the end it's the board's decision who you will not meet. You will not get to develop a relationship typically with the board. And you just have that person that's gonna be your voice in that group for that grant as they're reviewing probably 20 to 100, depending on what it is, very worthy applications. So how are you gonna make yours look better than everybody else's? And I can bet of those 100, you're probably not, you're going to probably be the only one that has this wonderful case for support along with it. And it gives you a cutting edge. So when you think about chasing your dream, I talked about making sure that you're looking at filling your service gaps and needs and ensuring you're not stepping on someone who's already doing it in your community. I can't tell you how many times I have someone come to me and say, Lauren, I want to start a nonprofit and we want to fix and do this. I say, great. Have you talked to these three agencies in Western North Carolina that are doing it? No. Go start there. We might not need you. But, or you might be able to partner with them, right? They might be doing it better because maybe they've got 20 years of support and services, or maybe they're doing it unethically and need to go. And that does happen too. And again, the partners that need to be at the table with you, get those MOUs, get those names in your case for support, get those big names as part of your, your host committee. 
decide those goals and the cost and who in your team is going to do it and who's going to be assigned to the report and making sure the report's done. I could tell you most of the time that's going to be you. Surprise. Get ready. And when I look at funding streams, I always look at if the past funders, the current funders, and who's funding those around us. But if you're brand new, it's great to start with those funding streams around you. And then again, you have to have a sustainable plan for your budget. And how are you going to keep it going? If you're asking for grants that are only one year, what are you going to do? And how are you going to stay in that in year two? Maybe you need to be looking at two-year grants which are out there. So really thinking through some of that funding, thinking through what part of your budget needs to be grants versus donors versus sponsors. I could tell you when I started here, our sponsors were around $20,000 a year. And um, in four years, we're now about $120,000 a year, just sponsors. So really diversifying that plan to have ongoing uh, funding. And one of those sponsors is $25,000 a year for five years. So $125,000 that I don't have to do anything else with except keep that cultivation for the next three years. I love those multi-year asks. What did that build? Sustainability. So let's talk about diversifying and expanding funding. We're going to get into a little bit of data. Any data nerds in the room with me? I hope I've got some. All right, data nerds, let's talk about it. I'm absolutely a data nerd. Oop. So when you think about diversifying and expanding your funding, and you look at how you want to raise your grant re revenue, I like to do a five-year past analysis plan of who's funded that agency. So when I first started here, in my first few months, I met with all my staff. I talked through all their goals. We started working out a strategic action plan. And I made a chart of funders. And then I made a plan to go target those funders, that cultivation plan. And then I made a chart of when stuff's due. And we'll look at some of that shortly. And, and who's going to be assigned to what part. Now, I was a party of one for the first year. So we'll talk about that too. And then when I made a report cheat sheet. And then we made a goal of how much revenue we wanted to increase our grants by and to see if we could do it. And then we looked at our program evaluations annually and our data analysis that we do every year. What do we wanna measure and show and create a plan that showed a year-to-year -year data analysis? And every year I pull that report so it's pulled the same way with the same funding, uh, excuse me, with the same report so that I know it's really comparable to show the trend of what numbers have changed over time. And then we do interviews or surveys with stakeholders that are conducted. Uh, again, I started first internally with our staff, and then I met with our partners and got feedback from them on their needs and what gaps they had. And then we went to our clients and we did surveys and interviews on their needs. And we could do that continuously throughout the program. Carrie, I see your hand raised. I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your main um, kind of metrics that you think should be tracked year over year in relation to grant revenue goals. Absolutely. I can do that at the end. Um, don't let me forget and I'll pull up and I'll, I'll show you what our, uh, oh, actually I've got one printed right here. I don't know how well you'll see it if I just hold it up. <clears throat> but mine won't look like yours. So let me start with that. But here's my comparison chart. And on this chart, it's fifth, uh, each column is a fiscal year, and it's fiscal year 16 through fiscal year 23. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because I've been here three years, and I told you I did a five-year before I started. So now I just add the year after it. And I looked at how many unique volunteers and how many hours, how many unique donors, how many unique sponsors. I looked at how many unique clients we were serving and their demographics. I looked at the not for our services. I looked at those specific outcomes we had decided were important for our program. So for us, number of bed fills and comparing adults and children, and then the total housed and the total number of bed fills. We look at um, not just unique clients, but specific services and outcome data. Outcome data is really important for grant writing. 
that's a whole hour in of itself to talk about developing goals and outcomes. And we looked at number of job trainees we had and how many hours we paid them and how many got long-term employment. We looked at outreach engagements we did in the community and number of participants. This is a fun number. We did 219 out outreach talks last year and we touched, you know, this is duplicated because we can't unduplicate number of trainees in each room. But over those 219, we had 6,830 participants that learned about healthy relationships. So this is us going into the school systems, teaching kids about healthy relationships and preventing human trafficking. If you didn't know, 90% of human trafficking is targeted through the internet to our children, social media. That's a whole talk of itself. So just important for you to develop what's important to track in your agency to show that you did it, to show that you're doing a good job, to show that you're ethically responsible. You're doing your fiduciary responsibility for the money you received. I do have that as a handout, but again, every program is going to be so different. It's really that thoughtful process of knowing what shows that you did a good job to really meet the goals you said you were going to do for your agency. Let's talk about community partnership. I'm hosting our, I think we're in year two for our interpersonal violence and abuse task force meeting tomorrow morning. And we've hosted that, uh, have 19 agency and community partners involved in that group to include local, local law enforcement, our Western North Carolina Governor's Crime Commission, other nonprofits that work with domestic violence and interpersonal violence, trafficking, sexual assault. We meet together quarterly to check in and we've developed specific goals that are part of our community's health assessment. And so it's just important that together we get together and show our commitment to each other and educate each other on what's going on, what's new, who's new, uh, touring each other's new people around our agencies to continue that partnership. But can you show an increase in the partners you work with? And I gave an example, maybe you want to go up 25% of partners or donors or grantors. How does your information get out to your supporters? Is it online, handouts, posters, social media, e-newsletters? And if you're doing it, are people reading it? Is it the right way that you're getting it out there for your audience? How are you increasing your community's awareness of the opportunities to partner and help fund you? To help them be part of what you're doing. To give them the opportunity to be part of the important work you're doing. How are they being invited? Are you tracking, I gave the example of the group meetings that you're sharing or the task force meetings that you're going to. And these are just examples of how you could track some of those numbers. Grant writing is both an art and a science. When I said the prerequisite is being a good writer, that's absolutely true. The science part is understanding the numbers and helping tell the numbers in a story that's exciting and being good at doing that together. And there are a lot of different roles. There's a lot of different forms and fun attachments. There is a way to get a perfect application that's better than just a general application. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about reporting and sustainability. When I started here at Safe Flight, I was the only grant writer on the team. I'm also the executive director. I will tell you, it is very often the case that you're in a smaller nonprofit, that the executive director is also the grant writer. And you got to build your team. But if you're a party of one, there are all these roles you're taking on. Or that you're trying to see if some of your team internally can be a part of. Luckily, my operation director accountant takes on the budget piece with me, and we do that together. We build that together, and we still do. And luckily, I'm now a party of four, <laughs> three years in. Every time I click, it takes a second to switch. There it goes. So when you talk about just leading the grant writing, so just being the leader, 
You have to oversee multiple programs typically with dozens of funding streams and each has lots of personalities that you're working through with each one. And you get the joy of remembering and tracking all of that. You have to be able to see five steps ahead so that your plans are empirically motivated. That's where that strategic action plan and that case for support are helping you do that. You gotta live so right now where I'm living in our budget, I'm in the fall writing budgets and grants for fall goals and projects. Not right now. That's done. We're on the next things that we're creating, doing funding, processing. I'm looking into funding that I know ends March of 2025 and preparing the budgets for what that looks like next. You have to be action driven to get the goals accomplished for the mission. And I see mission creep happen a lot as people see funding streams, they think, ooh, dollars. Don't take it if it doesn't fit. Don't scram, don't square whole round peg it, whatever that saying is. You've got to follow your mission and then find the funding or you're gonna hurt the agency. You're gonna make it hard for your team to do it. You have to make sure also that you're being ethical. No double dipping and stepping on toes. I taught on stepping on toes at the beginning where I said, are you going to take away from the pie of funding from someone who's doing great work and already doing it if you're creating a new project? If you're not, great, come on in. But you got to do the research first. Double dipping, let's talk about what that means. Let's say I have a project where I want to redo my resale store, and this is true. It started last Monday. We're doing it. So this project is actually about $150,000 project. So let's talk real on this project. When you put a grant request out there and you're doing that budget, you can't put several requests out there and then have a budget pending at $200,000 when your project's only $150,000. Because what are you going to do if you get a yes on all of those? You've got a problem. You can't do that. You have to plan out the budget and make the ask and have the timeline ethically that you're not over asking for the funding for that project. You can't go back to your foundation and say, oh, never mind. I'm sorry that y'all just spent six months working on this with us, but this other foundation is going to cover it. Will you do this instead? They're not going to like you. Don't do that. Now, what I will tell you on the downside is some of their timelines, and this is where you have to have a really good plan, and sometimes it just doesn't work out. I had a grand tour for this project, pending at 100000 We made it to round three. I thought for sure we had it. It was a six-month process, and the week before Christmas, it was actually December 22nd, I got the email that said we were not chosen. I was like, ah, oh, bummer. So what does that mean? Now that money's open again, and I have the opportunity to go try to write to fill that gap. I couldn't have written it before I got that. No, that budget piece was already taken and pending. Does that make sense? Still bummed, though. Still sad about that one. So when you think about leadership, it's your role to keep those ethics, to not dibble dip. You can't ask for something and use it for something else. I can't say thank you for funding this renovation of my resale store, but I'm going to put this towards the mortgage. That's not ethical. You have to ask and use the funding for what you put you were going to request it for. However, there are funders you could go back to and make requests or edit a budget. It doesn't mean that you can't go back and say, okay, we've got this done. This has happened as part of this process. We've discovered some asbestos in the renovation. Uh, do we have permission to help fix this with this funding? And if they say yes, then you're good to go. But you can't do it without the permission if you're changing what you're going to put it towards in the budget. When you think about your vision, you want to be really clear on your policies, procedures, protocols. Everyone in your agency should be able to access and follow that vision. You know, I think about those strategic action plans that mostly are just a fluff and example and not needed. Those mission statements that nobody in the agency can name or say what they are. What's the point? 
if you can't make it accessible, if your team isn't aware of the vision, how are they going to be committed to you as a leader and to be motivated to work towards that vision? How are they going to be excited about the work you're doing if they didn't even know it was part of the plan? How do they know they've got to win if you didn't tell them, guess what, we just got this and we're going to be able to hire a new clinician because this happened and all of you are a part of this and we're so grateful for you. you got to be able to communicate to your team if you're the leader. How are you balancing the fiscal and the services to ensure your agency can reach its full potential for serving your clients or your goals or whatever your mission is to its fullest? How are you consistent with your expectations? Are you doing regular check-ins? Are you reviewing that action plan with your leadership team and having them get impact from their team? Does your board get to see that every six months as an update to be excited about what you did or what struggles you're having so they can be like, oh, how can I help? What can I do? When you think about your grant roles, that's just the leader part of it. You also have your researcher, which I said their first goal was to look at who's already doing it and compare and make sure the gaps are needed. But you got to be sure if you're going to do the work and be the expert in your area doing the work, that you know what you're asking for and you've earned a piece of that pie because y'all can do it the best. You're going to be ethically the best to get this work done, not agency B over here that could have done it better. And do you have the data to show that you're going to be competitive and you can be around to make sure you can finish it and you're trustworthy to fund? There are a lot of funders that won't fund new agencies because of this. They want to see that you can be there, you're sustainable, you can get it done and be around. And then there's some funders that only fund newer small agencies. I saw one the other day, you had to be a budget of $300,000 or less. Okay, I'm out. But I shared it to a group that I thought might be able to use it as they're trying to do more food sources locally. Hey, did y'all see this? You might be able to qualify and use this. We can't. Or we're not the best ones to do it. I'm constantly seeing stuff as I'm looking around that I'll send to other nonprofits in the area that I know do good work. I send it to the ones that have a good reputation, not to the ones I'm like, mm, this one's better. They do it better and they do it well and they finish what they say they're going to do. Building those partnerships, those collaborations is huge, especially when you're going to foundations and ask and big donor ask who in your in your circle maybe can go do that with you as a point person to get you in that room and build that relationship. Lewis talked about at your humanitarian event you know, having the right people in the room, we had our North Carolina senator join us at our last event. And wouldn't you believe as I was taking um, them as their donor through our holiday giving, I took cook a plate of cookies over to his office to he and his wife. And she said, Lauren, will you let me know when you have another board opening? I'd love to join your board of directors. I said, hot dog. <laughs> That'd be great. Can't wait. So I've got her on the wait list because I have five interested in my board right now. There's a waiting list for that. That's never happened. How do you measure that you're successful? For me, a wait list of board members, other agencies coming to copy what we're doing. Success. So collaborating, stewardships of your funding. And like I said, you're not going to get them all. I don't get them all. And that's okay. I always write to see what didn't I get and how can I do it better? And I did that for that grant that we didn't get. And she said, oh, it was great. It's just we funded you last year and we didn't want to uh, we wanted to fund others this year. I said, OK. Wish I'd known that before I spent the time writing it. But, you know, <laughs> sometimes is what it is. So then in your grant roles, there's two more. I like to call these the least fun ones. <laughs> you've got your accountant, so you've got to make sure that you're applying the funding to what you said you were going to do. 
got to be able to show that you did your ethical financial responsibility, that the money went where it was supposed to, that you didn't double dip and you didn't charge this grant for the air units and this grant for the air units. It was the one that was assigned to it. Do you have enough funds to cover your agency until you get paid? Y'all, let's talk about this for a minute. Have a reserve fund. What's a healthy one? Three to six months of operation, minimum. When you get state federal grants, some of the bigger ones, some of them don't, when the grant opens, you might not get paid for six months to a year. I had an appropriation. It was 16 months before they paid us back. Can you stay open and fund that project while you wait for the money? Be prepared for that. Have a healthy reserve fund to fall back on so you're not going to hurt the agency because you wanted to go after some federal dollars that you then had to wait a year for. Oh, drive me nuts. And then you've got to track. We talked about reports. You've got to be able to make sure you had a really good data tracking system that people knew what was being entered and how it was being entered and how it's going to be tracked. And you're following up. We do a, I have my program managers every month do a check-in on their monthly reports to make sure their team didn't forget how we said we were tracking stuff so that our outcomes at the end of the year or at the mid-year report are going to be accurate for what we said we were going to do. And you know you're following all the regulations that are required through having really good program manuals, operation manuals, trainings for your staff on that database, tracking a cheat sheet on their entries. Do you have a good database? Does everybody know how to use it? We do a six month required in, uh, um, database training internally for our direct service entry every six months. We do it again because I promise you people forgot how to do it because most social workers or help or even um, anybody who's working human services, data tracking isn't typically our um, forte. So we have to make sure that's part of our plan. Marketing and public relations is a huge part of everything you should be doing. Because if you're doing good work, but you're not telling your donors, your supporters, your funders, your grantors, your staff, what you did and how excited they should be about being a part of that, then why should anybody care? Everybody's doing great work. How are you keeping yourself exciting in your community of the work that you do? How are you marketing your agency and keeping people in tune to be excited and part of that work? It's part of every piece of what we've talked about. It's part of your case for support. It's part of your advancement counter. It's part of your grant work. It's part of your team strategy. This is one example from one grant where they said, great, you've gotten funded. We want all these things for marketing. And this is just a one year foundation project we had to send these days. I was like, great, okay. <laughs> and then you know what? Um, I invited them to our ribbon cutting. They couldn't make it, but they just thanked me for being invited and part of it. And I make sure that they gave me permission to add them to our, e, our monthly e-newsletter so they could be in the new in the, and know what we have going on. So different types of grant funding. Don't start with government if you've never done grant writing. That's just going to scare you away and you're never going to want to do grant writing again. But the good news is once you start writing grants, you get a good repertoire. It's the same, same. It's just they want a whole lot more <laughs> and a lot more reports. And you have to usually learn a lot of databases just to do it. I saw someone earlier, there's a couple comments in the chat on, is there a good spot to look for your foundation or grants in your area? And there, are, I would say GodStar is probably the best, uh, which Lewis mentioned. Uh, there's a couple of others, but it really depends on the kind of work you do. Most of you, if you're just a local community, you won't need to pay for a subscription to one of those databases. You just need to look around. See what the agencies like you in your area you're getting, look on their website, pull their annual reports off their website and look at who they listed as their grant supports for the year. 
So usually get them to your local United Way, your community foundations, some local foundations that families have, and then it's uh, working through those. Going to do a lot of talks at local groups, women's group, churches, um, uh, meeting groups like Rotaries, Kiwanis, going out there and kind of getting your name in the in the work. But then you want to look at um, contracts, depending on the type of work you, you have. There might be procurements. There might be certain contracts you could get as part of the work you do, especially if it's medical or mental health. Um, so it really depends. There's not a perfect answer. It depends on the kind of work you're doing, where this goes. But I will say no matter what, diversification is always the answer. So diversifying your donor base, diversifying your grant base, diversifying your team, all of that's going to work to have a better foundation for your grant plan. <clears throat> so again, I always start by looking at who we've been, who's funded us the last couple of years and making that sort of my start. I go to all the local ribbon cuttings and chamber events. My favorite story is last year I went to our local hands-on museum's ribbon cutting and looked on, on their wall where they put the stars up for who funded their project. And I learned about Glass Foundation that funds our county. I said, ooh, let me go. I wrote it down. I took a picture of it. And I went and researched it. And they fund our county and one other county nationally. And I looked them up. And they specifically fund capital campaigns. I said, hot dog. I wrote a grant, met with their team. I got 200000 Never would have known except I went to the um, ribbon cutting and saw their name on the wall. I had no idea who they are. Now we have a great relationship. Research, uh, again, I told you, you know, those around you, I get all of the newsletters um, from our community partners. I'm signed up for those. I read them. I get their mailers. I see who they're listing as their funders and their sponsors, who they're listing on their websites as a thank you to their grantors. I'm like, man, they make my work so easy. They just give me a cheat sheet to start off of. So I, then I just look to see if there's one I don't have. And then I research it. And now I give it to my grant support staff and she researches it. I'm like, here's the ones to see if do we need to look at them. So it's just a great way to start, especially um, even internationally, looking at other groups internationally, Chris, like yours, to see what do they have? Who are they getting? Who are they listing? So you got to be a good grant writer in this competition. So if you're not, excuse me, a good writer, you need to do some writing classes. You need to know about APA style and research and how to write a grant and, and document and cite resources. We're not going to talk about ChatGBT today, but I did put ChatGBT on there because some people use it. I ethically don't. I don't feel that I need it. I've got a good cheat sheet of my own started, but you know, if you want to start there and get a couple of sentences helping you get started, okay. But are you inspiring enough in your writing to get the investment? Read it out loud to your partner at home or your friend. See if they get excited. And if they don't, you need to go back and fix that. If you're not excited reading it, you need to go back and fix that. Imagine the pie and make sure that your project's worthy enough because you might be taken away from someone else who's hungry and can get the work done. Do your research, know who's going to be your partners in your competition, who your audience is you're writing to is essential for the grant you write. Do you fit their goals? Or are they going to come back and say, why did you waste our time? We don't fund capital projects. We only fund kids in elementary school. So don't write for something that is not their goal. Don't put them on your sheet if it's not part of it. Re oh, a great step into grant writing. Go join a review team. Every United Way always is looking for those to help review grants. You will learn real quickly what looks good and what doesn't. And I promise you, everybody who submits that thinks their grant's fantastic and it's the best. You'll learn real quickly those grants are terrible. And what does a good grant look like? A healthy budget. What percent of the annual budget for your agency is healthy for diversification? When I do a grant master document for my cut, this is be one you want to take a picture of. This is a nice cheat sheet. When I do a grant cheat sheet budget for any agency I'm working with, these are things I kind of have ready to go on that couple of pages. And 
these are something you're going to be asked in almost every grant and just have it ready to go. Well, the first thing they're usually going to ask is for your um, for your numbers for your agency. So they're going to want to know that and who the contact person is, of course. But then they're going to ask about the mission, the history of your organization, your um, description of your purpose for the program, the project, the activities. Explain the problem that you're going to be solving. How are you going to accomplish this? And some of the things that you're excited and proud of as an agency. What are some of those challenges? What are the goals and outcomes? Do you have a DEI statement? This gets asked a lot. Are there opportunities for them to volunteer with you or to be part of it? Is there a timeline? And a lot of this, let me tell you, you will have answered in your case for support. You're just going to get a little bit more detailed here in your grant cheat sheet. For us, I just thought this would be a good um, breakout for y'all to see just for where I work, for our percent of a healthy budget, this is where we are now. We're 32% donation sponsors, which I'm proud of because when I started, it was about 10% of our annual budget. So I'm really excited that that's uh, beefed up really well. We've got about 25% state, city, county funding, about 20% federal, which is great because federal keeps cutting in our line of work. So I want that to go smaller because I know they're going to keep cutting and I need to diversify. So we're not stressed out to have to cut staff. Had a grant meeting, re excuse me, an agency Western North Carolina meeting recently. And uh, there was probably about 20 of us on the call and everybody was planning to cut staff except us. Why? because we did a huge grant plan, knowing 40% cuts were coming federally to diversify our stream and not have to lose programming. In fact, we added programming next year and I added staff. 17% is foundation grants or contracts and about 6% revenue. We have a store and cafe that helps bring in a little bit of our revenue. And then for a healthy budget, you'll get asked a lot, um, what percent of your funding goes towards admin versus direct services. And I love Lewis's answer to that. 100% of our work goes to direct services. And that is absolutely true. I am a clinical social worker. I do clinical work with my team constantly. But on our budget, if you look just at my admin team, we're about 15% of the budget. But all of us do direct service work. And Lewis, I see you want to say something there. Yeah, I know in some of your applications and in some of the hoops that you're made to jump through uh, for your funding, you're going to have to uh, answer this uh, stupid question. Uh, but it is a stupid question. And uh, over time, part of what we're doing at Nano is uh, to change that and confront that. Um, never, ever, ever have you been to a restaurant and when the bill comes, have you looked at the server and said, now, how much of this is going to the chef? Never, ever, ever have you bought a car and looked at the salesperson and said, now, how much of this is going to the general manager? Every dollar that a business spends is necessary to run the business. Every dollar that a nonprofit spends is necessary to run the nonprofit. And I have no problem defending every line item in your budget because I know that you are working as hard as you can on a budget that is much lower than it should be to serve the people that you're serving. Um, somehow donors have this idea that programs and services are just going to drop out of the sky into the lives of children and families, and it's ridiculous. Oh, would you like us to run our million-dollar organization without a bookkeeper? Oh, would you like us to run our $2 million nonprofit without a CEO? So it's a ridiculous question that should never have been asked in the first place, and we're working to dispel that myth. Sorry, Lauren, I, I turn it back to you. No, you said I keep moving my boxes around as on my slides. So I'm like, where's my mute button now? It's up there. 
Um, and I see lots of questions in the chat, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, Lessa, I see, or excuse me, it might be Lisa. I see your hand raised. Did you want to ask something? Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question about uh, your word sponsors. And you've mentioned sponsors a couple times. When I think of sponsors, I think of event sponsors. But how do you all work with, how do you all name a sponsor for your organization? What does that mean? So for us, and everybody would be a little bit different, but we have event sponsors and then we have annual sponsors. So for our annual sponsors, they get to sponsor our events through the year. And they may also have something uniquely attached to that. So I have an annual sponsor who's also our Camp Hope America t-shirt sponsor. So they get to be on our t-shirt and they're the Camp Hope Week special sponsor. I have a cafe sponsor who gets to name a menu item that we create together. So I have the Champion Caprese sandwich. It's delicious. And I have the Stellar Power Salad. They didn't mind sharing when I found out two different groups wanted it. They said, great. And so they both got to be cafe sponsors and didn't mind sharing, which I absolutely checked with first before we did. And then I have a resale store canopy sponsor. And for five years, their logo is printed on both canopies outside of our resale store. And that's a five-year commitment because, again, I don't want to change my canopies for five years. And I'm hoping they still look good. They'll want to tag in. So we just got creative. None of that existed three years ago. We didn't have annual sponsors. And everybody's agency would be a little bit different on how you get creative to think about your marketing and your sponsorship. But for our year this year, it's our 40th anniversary. So we're going to have a mortgage burning party 40-year sponsor. Um, and I'm hoping that's going to be First Citizens Bank. And I'm waiting on that final yes because, well, we're burning their mortgage because we're paying it off. So it'll be kind of a fun, it works in with that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to piggyback on that, Lauren. Um, we encourage all of you to have a, to have a giving, to create a giving menu for your team internally. So when you think about the programs and services you offer, how much money impacts uh, a particular group of people in a particular way. So for instance, $250,000 serves 300 veterans for a year. $100,000 serves 200 uh, homeless families for a year. $50,000 provides uh, an after-school program for 100 kids for a year. So creating that list of dollars that's attached to impact, another way to say that is putting a price tag on your mission. If you do that internally, you create that giving menu, which is, by the way, the way our entire world works. You go to a restaurant, you get a menu. Uh, here are all the items, and here's how much it costs. You go to uh, you go to any store. Every item is attached to a cost, and oh, by the way, that cost includes admin, um, everything it costs for that store to bring that product to market. Um, and so, if you create that menu of that price list internally for your organization, then when you go to a potential funder, you then can go to that menu and say, okay, what do I think we're going to talk about today? Now, I would not suggest you give a potential funder 15 different items on the menu because it can be overwhelming, but you draw from that internal menu and pick two or three things that you wanna focus on in that conversation, take that with you, and then you can find out what they may be interested in funding at a particular uh, level. So you just saw my annual sponsor menu. But when I make the first citizen ask, most of those are taken. I'm just giving them the two that are available. I'm waiting on that answer. I hope it'll be this one. And so I make sure they know they're going to be highlighted our events for that calendar year. And I made sure that that year is identified. <laughs> and then what comes along with that? So it starts with a logo on the marketing materials, list on the website, social media. We do a weekly um, announcement on local radio station that they're highlighted on and then tickets for those events. And then it can go up from there because I'm hoping they'll be our signature sponsor for their mortgage burning party. 
Uh, Lauren, there's a question in the chat about uh, best practices for uh, sponsorships. Um, and let me let me read it because uh, I have some thoughts on that. Natalie says, any resources you can suggest for sponsorship best practices? Um, well, I'll just offer a few thoughts on sponsorships. First of all, only promise what you can deliver. So don't make promises to a sponsor that you can't fulfill. Um, number two, keep a record of promises you've made, um, which means you've got to document internally uh, for your team what you promised to a sponsor, and you should also give that to the sponsor. So everybody's on the same page. And then number three, load up those top sponsorship levels with all the benefits. Because you know if you secure those top sponsorship levels, the lower levels don't matter as much. And, and what I see too much of is this, oh, platinum level sponsor, $10,000, two tables at event. Gold level sponsor, $5,000, one table at event. Uh, Silver level sponsor, 2,500, four tickets to event. And the problem is what you've done is you divided the benefits according to the cost. And that's not what you want to do. You want to load up that $10,000 level with all the benefits. And you want to make those other levels, 5,000, 2,500, look like they suck. Because then when you go to your $10,000 sponsor, your top level, they're like, wow, I get all this for $10,000 and why would I want to spend $5,000 and only get that? So um, load up those top levels and focus on getting those sponsorships first. You can always figure out how to get the lower levels and make adjustments. And oh, by the way, you can always have secret sponsorship levels. So let's say you go to someone and you want them to sponsor something for $4,000 and your next level, uh, excuse me, you want them to sponsor something for $5,000 and your next level down is $2,500 and they say to you, well, all I've got left in the budget is $4,000. Well, don't say, well, great, we'll take the $2,500. You say, great, we'll take that $4,000 and we'll make you the bar sponsor or the band sponsor or whatever. Figure out a way to get that four thousand, um, if that's what they've got, and they can't get to that five thousand dollar level. Thanks, Lauren. I love all that, and I'm just going to highlight something Lewis said. Your team has the same communication, and we're all checking in. And I'm making sure because I checked in recently. We had a yes from a local hospital in October. They hadn't sent us the logo, and it's January third, and they're supposed to start January one. Hey, where's the logo? Nobody got it. Okay, let me check back in and get the logo. And then we got it. Okay, now we got the logo on the website. But it's making sure who's in charge of following up to make sure those things were done and that you met those requirements. Because you don't want to come back and it's March and they lost three months of part of something you promised. Just because someone didn't get it, right? So this is a cheat sheet of documents to throw in your grant folder. Uh, these are things you're going to get asked for constantly when you're writing. You want to just have them kind of ready to go. You're going to have just a basic cover letter on your letterhead that you can go in and edit and tailor to that grant. You want to have your annual report in there, your 990, a shortened version because usually you can't put up the whole thing, but the first couple pages. Your uh, If you're 501c3, you want to have that letter. You're probably going to need a W9. Ooh. Um, if they're, depending on what it's paying for, you'll get asked for that a lot. You're going to want to have your EIN number or what other numbers that are part of your agency that that's usually what you go plug in first. The audit and the right kind of audit, you know, did you have your audit and is it up, the most up to date one that's in there for you to put? Your board approved budget, um, the budget for the project. You may get asked for avoided check ready to go for some of those. I don't get asked that too often, but I've had it recently twice, so I'll put it on here. List of some of your top supporters, and I will tell you, if I list donors, I put a confidential name. I'll say individual donor, not their name and the amount. Uh, 
list of your board of directors and sometimes they'll ask for age, gender, ethnicity, years on the board in their current job role. And I also make sure on my board list I have our committees and who's in that and who on that committee may be a board member or just a, a committee member. Your case for support and your attachments, whether it be pictures, renderings, architect plans, et cetera, that are part of that project are really good for you to have ready to go in that folder. And then I make a planning sheet and do this with my grants team where we divide out on a spreadsheet and we have the funder, the dates, the amount requested, the amount received, what the project's for, who the contact is for that project, and anything else gets tapped on a, a different tab on that spreadsheet for what's pending and received and what reports are due and what links to do those reports with the dates. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. And then I also, oh, that's your homework. Hold on. Come back to that. I'm going to show you this. Got a lot of attachments here. Great writing. So that cheat sheet I was just talking about. I've got too many things open. I apologize. There's the Zoom share. Here it is. So this is sort of a blank example of what you could go fill in and color coordinate and highlight. I'll usually have it yellow here if it's one I'm working on right now. And then it'll be black if it's one never to write it for again. That's what I use as my color of vault. This wouldn't have fit. Red if it's in queue and we're working on it. Blue if it's written and we're waiting on an answer. Green means it's funded. And that's my color coordination, but really tracking some of that. Uh, Lauren, um, could I have your permission to share your case for support? There have been a few questions in uh, chat about that. So I'd love to uh, review the elements of your case for support. Do you want me to pull it up while you're talking? I think I've got it right here. You do. <clears throat> um, so, and Lauren, it's your case for support, so chime in. But, but uh, so, Safe Light, Changing Community in Henderson County. Now, so notice that the case for support has a very simple front, clear messaging about the organization, and a simple theme. All right, now, normally I would say we want to put pictures of smiling uh, kids and families on the front of a case for support, one, really, one or two really good pictures. But in Lauren's case, she serves a population where confidentiality and privacy is, is the, the, what, the top concern, right? So we don't get to do that, but they live in the beautiful mountains, so they were able they were able to, to put that mountainscape um, to which everyone in Henderson County will relate. Um, and it's a beautiful cover for their case. Then um, there's a letter from Lauren. And this letter from the executive director or CEO needs to be personal. Um, again, don't just string together a bunch of uh, buzzwords. I'm proud to be serving as a partner in this community to bring about change, to empower families, to help people envision their future. It blah, 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 blah means nothing. What Lauren has done a great job of is personalizing her letter because if someone's going to take the time to read this case for support, it should be interesting. It should be personal. It should help people get to know Lauren so that when she calls them um, or when she meets with them, they're like, oh, I remember uh, what she wrote. Um, and then she was very smart in putting um, the, a picture of the ribbon cutting when they, when they were funded the first facility uh, under her leadership that was new, um, they did a ribbon cutting. I was there, there's my bald head kind of um, uh, in the middle to the left. Then um, they review Safe Light's impact in the community. Um, 
Then there's a timeline, and this timeline is very important because they go all the way back to 1838 when Henderson County was established. Why is this important? With your community, with your state, with your country, with the issue that you're serving, you want people to see that you're woven in with your community and the tapestry of your community. You want people to see that with an issue that you're serving, that your, your organization is woven in with that issue. So you get to go way back because that's part of the story about how you came to be, about how you, you were created. So go back to the beginning. Um, they go to 1920. And then finally, in 1974, um, the, the, one of the first organizations that led to Safe Light was founded. Um, so they go through facts and figures. Then normally we would say, again, uh, give this section would be for testimonies of, of people that you served. But be, again, because Lauren's population confidentiality is of utmost importance, instead, she profiled a philanthropist and a volunteer. Brilliant, because they got to talk about how their lives have been changed by the work of Safe Light. Um, so we're protecting the confidentiality of the people we're serving, and we're highlighting and celebrating uh, a philanthropist and a volunteer. Um, then uh, Lauren was able to uh, uh, establish these initiatives, three clear initiatives, and then here's the summary budget on the facing page. And th these to me are the two most important pages in any case document. What are the initiatives we want to achieve? How much are they going to cost? This provides the conversation then with a potential funder and it lays it out in a very clear way. Um, and then she was able to list some of the important people that had been a part of the organization and then contact information on the back. Okay, um, you all uh, have been wonderful. Uh, Lauren, let me go ahead and let you assign some homework. Yeah, my last slide was giving y'all homework because like I said, I'm a data nerd. This is what you get. <laughs> now there's no one who's gonna follow up with you to see if you do it. So, oops, I hit the wrong thing, but I'll just leave it right there. Um, but I was just suggesting that you start working on these three things now. What need is missing and what do you need to fund? How much money do you need? and who's gonna partner in or support this work. Because all of that gets you started for the beginning of what's required. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lewis. Um, great job as always. Uh, so Keith, I see your question in, uh, the chat. I don't know if that's a can of worms, Lauren, or if that's a fish hook with a worm on it and Keith is trying to hook me. I love this question. Trouble. I'm going to come back to it. Um, but before I do, let me just, uh, go back to the major guest ramp up model and, as we started today, I tied in with you how grants are a part of this overall model for fundraising. And can you see how in Lauren's teaching and the material that she reviewed, all 13 steps of this model connect with each step in the grant funding process? Um, and so... If you go to nonprofitconferences.org, um, I'll put that link in the chat again. Um, we offer two-day seminars on the Major Gifts Ramp-Up model, and you can learn all kinds of wonderful things, um, not only about securing grant funding, but also uh, about securing funding from individuals and families in one-on-one -on -one uh, conversations. Now, oh, you got a grant queen, uh, Lauren. I love uh, 
Um, I think for the copy of presentation, that's just a Lewis question. But I wanted to highlight something Lewis just said about the um, the major gifts ramp up. I do it every year to refresh me because making an ask is not what I'm great at. I'm better at the development, the great writing, the vision. So I need Lewis to remind me constantly how to make an ask and that I can do it. So I do the major gifts ramp up now. I think I've done it three times. Do it every year as a refresher so that I feel confident because it's not my strength. Thanks, Lauren. All right, Keith says in the chat, a board can be a huge asset or an enormous liability. If time allows, we'd love to hear your thoughts on building an advisory board that creates credibility and opportunities for partnerships and fundraising. Yes, Keith, thank you. Uh, so in the major gifts ramp up model, chapter 10 is building the campaign cabinet, which effectively is your advisory board. Uh, 15 community leaders, who are going to help you make connections for the purposes for the purpose of fundraising? Um, they do not have a vote in your organization. They uh, are not able to wield any power in your organization. You may have one or two board members who end up on that campaign cabinet because they want to serve in that capacity, but never in the history of nonprofits. Have you had a board made up of 15 or 20 people that just love to do fundraising? So it's a ridiculous concept that people continue to push on you that, oh, you just need to get a better board. Oh, you just need to um, get better people on your board to help you do fundraising. No, that worked 60 years ago. It doesn't work now. And it didn't even work that well 60 years ago. So your board should exist only for advice and accountability. Your board has nothing to do with fundraising, nor should they be guilted into doing fundraising because they don't want to do it. And then you set up a separate campaign cabinet, which may have some of your board members on it. And that campaign cabinet, that advisory council, helps you for fundraising. If you have a board member who serves in dual roles or you have a board member who is a major donor, it's two separate conversations. One conversation, one-on-one, -on -one, can be with that person about how she would like to, to help with the board in the coming year. The other conversation, one-on-one, -on -one, with that person is about how she would like to be involved philanthropically with your organization. But you've got to disconnect the two concepts. Board members should not be doing fundraising. Board members should not be required to give a major gift. Please do not hand out a sheet of paper every January or every J July in a board meeting that makes everybody write down their commitment. It's ridiculous, and you're not going to get their best gift. If I have a social worker on my board, I'm interested in, in her knowledge and her expertise. I'm not interested in her being able to give me $50. And if you have to jump through some stupid hoop about 100% board giving, here's what you do. You take a $20 bill, you go to the bank, you get $21 bills. You go to the board meeting and you hand everybody a $1 bill. And you just ask them to keep it there, not put it away. And then at the end of the board meeting, you walk around and you pick up those $1 bills. Boom, you have 100% board giving. If someone is going to ask you a stupid question, then you get to give them a stupid answer. And there you have it. So, Lauren, I probably have gotten myself in trouble for this rant about boards, but Keith sucked me in. I couldn't help it. I actually really appreciate all of that, Lewis. This is what drew me to the nano model is the reality of nonprofits are a business. Does it nonprofit doesn't mean no money. And your board is to help with the three things I just typed in the chat. Hire, keep your CEO, financial oversight, impact review. You have a separate campaign or fundraising committee or both. I have a campaign committee and an events committee. There, there are a lot of questions about chat about wanting a copy of uh, your uh, these documents or case for support or um, uh, wanting this presentation. 
if you attend the two day conference, um, even if you attend just day one of the two day conference, and I say day one, it's usually about nine to three, then we will um, offer you an opportunity to have access to the Major Gifts Ramp Up Cloud. And the Major Gifts Ramp Up Cloud is the largest online library of nonprofit resources in the world. There are hundreds of case for support documents. There are hundreds of event invitations. There are hundreds of grant uh, proposals and individual ask proposals in the Major Gifts Ramp Up Cloud. So that's the best source of, of information, but we do invite you to attend um, one of the virtual or in-person events at nonprofitconferences.org. Chris Bergen, I'm going to be in Dallas April 16th and 17th. We'd love to meet some of you in person. We're going to be near DFW. So if you want to have a, an excuse to travel and meet me and Chris, please join us in Dallas um, in April. Right, Chris? <laughs> yes, we'll have some barbecue. <laughs> That's right. We'll have some barbecue. Has her hand raised. Is that for me? Yes. Um, forgive the background noise. It's a snow day for my kids. So, um, okay. My question is, can you give a little bit of a description about how you facilitate those cabinet members and their um, fundraising, how you pull, you know, that fundraising capacity from them. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go back to the major gifts ramp up model, um, just responding from somebody in chat, Carrie. So remember, um, Carrie, that one of the first things we're going to do in the major gifts ramp up model is build a case for support. And we're going to test that case for support with early potential leaders. So let me bring this up. All right, so Carrie, if you take a look at um, chapter four, we built this case for support and we're testing it with potential campaign leadership. So that's a first cultivation tool is we're looking at who are people that we already know and who are community leaders that we can go to and sit down and ask for their advice. When we have the opportunity to, to review case for support and ask someone for their advice, it enables us to gauge their enthusiasm for what we're doing. In some cases, people are so enthusiastic, they'll say, what can I do to help? That's a great opportunity to say, well, Linda, um, one of the opportunities that we have during this effort is we're going to have a group called the Campaign Cabinet. Is that something you'd be interested in hearing more about? So Carrie, that would be the first place where you have an opportunity to engage early on a campaign cabinet member. Then chapter six, we're inviting 2,500 millionaires and community influencers to a chapter seven non-fundraising awareness event. And then we're following up one-on-one -on -one with conversations. So chapter eight, coming out of that awareness event where we've got 150 to 200 new people that we're meeting and and then we get to sit down with them one-on-one, -on -one, engage their enthusiasm. We've done some research about them. How much money do they have? We've done some wealth screening. How are they connected in the community? Well, if we find out that Sheila Jones is the CEO of the hospital and we've never met her before, Sheila might be a great person to have on our cabinet. So in chapter eight, again, we, we sit with Sheila and Sheila, at some point, is going to say, how can I help? And Carrie, that's an opportunity to say, well, one opportunity would be for you to serve in campaign leadership. Then chapter nine at the one year mark, this evening event, it's a table hosted event. We're going to have 25 tables of eight. Those 25 table hosts are going to be bringing new people um, to that event. And we're going to be following up with those people, and we may very well find 
that uh, during that evening, there's some new people that we can ask to serve on the cabinet. So during this first year during the, of the major gifts ramp up model, every step of the way, we have opportunities to sit down with people one on one and then uh, ask permission to review ways that they can serve in the campaign, one of those being the campaign cabinet. And our goal over that during that first year is to find the right 15 people to serve on that campaign cabinet. Is that helpful, Carrie? Yeah. So I'm hearing that maybe the cabinet members are actually connected to foundations or. Okay. I see. So they're part of those foundations that you're hoping to cultivate. A hundred percent. Um, I, I, I would, I love, um, to have, someone with the community foundation on my campaign cabinet. Um, you know, in, in Lauren's case, I would love to have someone from Advent Health Foundation on my campaign cabinet, because not only is that cultivating them for funding from their organization, but because they run in that circle, right? They run in those circles and breathe that air. They're going to help connect us with other foundations and other funders. And on I a see. side note, I joined their foundation. So then I get to see a lot of their funders and what's happening. <laughs> I mean, what y'all got going? So I'm I on know. Lauren got on the board of Advent Health Foundation. Genius. All right, you all, we've gone solid for uh, just about two and a half hours. Um, uh, so what other final questions or comments would you like to offer uh, anyone in the group? Yes, uh, we're even in the study. Uh, thank you very much for this lovely webinar. Uh, please, I heard you mention that you are having a conference with uh, I'm from Nigeria. So I don't know if you have any uh, uh, scholarship for, uh, for the conference. Uh, if somebody can apply to, to get it, so to, uh, able to attend the conference. And because uh, I want to attend the conference, but I have don't have the capacity to pay uh, to attend the conference right now in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, thanks for that. And I'm happy to, to send you the, the scholarship code and the link in the chat. Uh, so I'll take care of that. Um, any other questions about the major gifts ramp up model or about uh, securing uh, foundation grant funding? Uh, Lewis, this is Jimmy Edwards. Um, I've got one quick question. I I thought all the materials that you did today were great, and I really enjoyed it. I'm missing one little element. I'm not sure that I put it all together right. The title of this was The, so the Five Secrets for Attracting Foundation Grants. I'm not yes. sure what the five secrets are. Lauren, can you go back? I think it's your first slide. First slide. Hold on one second. And I apologize if it was skipped over. Um, Lewis, while I pull that back up, if you want to grab that question in the chat that just came through. All right. I'm, I'm trying to love the material you put out. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not complaining. I just wasn't, I can't kind of say this is number one, this is number two. Like that. Oh, yeah. well, it's not quite as clear as that. I, I'd say that that title is a little bit more of the overview versus the the nitty gritty. But I think in your first slide you did uh, cover that, Lauren. There you go. Yeah, uh, there are the five things. So no. All right. Uh, and then we talk helps. videos through the talk. So that's. Oh, question that's, that's on. I think was, are we seeing the trends of funding drop 
and but the res they're still expecting the same results, yes. <laughs> Especially federally. It's really frustrating, isn't it? That's where that diversification of funding comes. But here's what's funny. You still write the same reports and like your United Ways or your um or those federal dollars are still at, you know, quoting or thinking they're part of all of that, but they're, you know, they're not a hundred percent of making that happen, are they, anymore? I don't think Lauren is going to get too mad at me for what I'm about to say. Well, I, um, I guess what I would say is you gave us a lot more information than those five secrets. Yeah, it's hard for me not to. I could probably talk all day. Um, yeah, okay. I just thought I was having trouble finding the five, but you gave us plenty. I'm not complaining. I'm just... <laughs> Thank you. So um, I want to go back to Kathy's question, and I, and I hope Lauren doesn't get too mad at me for saying this. I don't think she will. But um, most people see grants as the pot of gold, the end of the rainbow. And they they have this idea that they're these um, unicorn uh, funding sources out there just waiting for your wonderful applications so that they can give you millions of dollars. And as you've seen, uh, uh, Lauren, over the last hour and a half described, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes in and a tremendous amount of organization that goes into a, 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 to getting any amount of grant funding, and it requires those personal conversations. The reality, uh, Kathy, is that 80% of philanthropy year, over, year after year after year comes from individuals and family foundations, and that includes bequests. Um, but it's their decisions that are made by individuals and families. And that, that 80% of philanthropy, that funding comes with far fewer strings attached. So yes, you know, in the major gifts ramp up model, we certainly include grants and foundations as part of your mix of your top 100, but we want to see your funding sources mirror what we see across the country. And ideally, we'd like to see 80, roughly 75 to 80% of your funding coming from individuals and families. Now, look, we understand if you're in an agency um, or you're in an organization that is serving a particular need that can qualify for government grant funding, then that's going to skew those numbers. But even if you are primarily government, state, or local grant funded, you have an opportunity to secure and diversify your revenue through individual and family uh, gifts that are going to be more fun and come with fewer strings attached. And I hope you don't mind um, me throwing this up in there, but this just for my agency, from we started with Nano in 2020, and our individual giving has tripled. Because one of the things I notice is, man, our individual giving is way too low as part of our annual budget. We really need to raise that. And so we tripled our annual giving. We doubled nearly our grant giving. Excuse me, not double, but it's gone up about 50% since 2020. And now we have a budget that over three years that has doubled to a little over $3.2 million. So it takes, when I say you start here and then you go, all of that is part of making it happen. And it takes a couple of years. You got to build the dream and then find the funding. Thank you, Lisa, for putting the secrets in the chat. Uh, and Lauren was gracious enough to provide her email uh in the chat lauren at nano.org um and uh so lauren will uh if you email her and you want the scholarship code she will uh provide that for you um and we also uh are going to be intentional about following up with all of you following today's event um to hear about what's going on in your organization and to hear how we can help. Um, as I said in the beginning, we don't want this to be our first and only conversation with you. Um, NANO, the National Association of Nonprofit Organizations and Executives, exists to serve you and make your life 
easier. We exist to help you grow your mission to change and save more lives. So uh, thank you for all the time that you've spent with us today. And we look forward to vis visiting with you personally. I want to encourage each of you as we go. I know there are days when you wonder if anyone is listening. I know there are days if you wonder if anyone is reading your emails or is going to return your phone calls. Um, I know that there are days when you wonder if anyone cares, and that's just your board. And on those dark days, on those cloudy, rainy days, um, I want you to know that the sun is always shining above the clouds. And uh, continue to look up, continue to power forward. Um, you all have been put on this earth with a purpose, and you've been given this calling and this purpose to change and save lives. So thank you for your energy. Thank you for your courage. And we look forward to uh, having more conversation with each of you. God bless you. Have a great day.